The universe takes no note what reference frame you choose. Michael Brenner What are the biggest scientific problems of the globe earth model? Or the biggest arguments against it? The biggest problems with all the scientific models, as well as the prime source of errors, is the neglecting of the demarcation lines between domains of validity. The result is an endless squabble about true or not true, about verified and observed and predicted, and all these totally fruitless as well as endless battles. Therefore, it should be routine to begin every scientific discussion by agreeing about these domains and their borders in order to immediately understand what part of the argument is limited to what domain. These three domains, geometry, kinematics, dynamics. Geometry only describes dots, lines, and surfaces and their relative arrangement. Geometry does not include motion, masses, and forces. So to take a geometry and just slap a motion and a mass into it is a violation of this domain and thus necessarily produces errors. Kinematics then adds the concept of motion to dots, lines, and surfaces. But still, there is no consideration whatsoever of masses and forces. So taking a kinematic model and making it for a representation of physical reality is a violation of this domain and can't but produce errors. Geometry and kinematics are branches of mathematics, which is a theoretical domain and not a domain dealing with tangible physical reality. Dynamics then adds the consideration of real world masses and forces to the theoretical concepts of geometry and kinematics, which makes dynamics into a branch of physics. The investigation of the behavior of actual physical bodies, this can no longer be done with pen on paper. This can only be done by way of experiments. The question here is about problems with globe earth model. So let's apply the above domains to the two most fundamental aspects of this model and see how they fare. Rotation and orbit. First we have to look at the shape of a globe. It is claimed to be a sphere. This is a geometric position with dot center, line, radius, and the surface. Next it is said that it rotates uniformly. This is a kinematic proposition, adding the concept of angular displacement around a rotational axis to the static concept of a sphere. Now we have to transfer these propositions into the domain of physical reality, the domain of dynamics, by adding mass to the sphere and forces to the mass. Here is where we have to stop theorizing where we have to look to experimental data, where we have to listen to what Mother Nature tells us about herself and how she chooses to behave. These observed behaviors are beyond our influence and therefore non-negotiable. So neglecting what we know about the behavior of massive bodies in motion violates this domain and can't but produce errors. What it is we got here then we got a sphere with a uneven distribution of its masses, continents, and on top of that, we have a postulated non-solid interior by which this rotating sphere can dissipate rotational energy. There is no sense in theorizing how such a body would behave. We have to ask nature, and what does she tell us? She tells us that Freely rotating bodies with uneven mass distribution and option to dissipate energy will end up rotating around the axis of maximum momentum. They will thus rotate in a minimum energy state. This is actually not surprising at all. On the contrary, this is a very predictable logic behavior for real world bodies. Now we go back and see if the proposed globe with the given mass distribution and the postulated semi-liquid interior behaves the way nature tells us it would. And that means we have to check if the real world globe rotates about the maximum momentum minimum energy state axis. The rotational pole axis should go through the Pacific with the masses of the continents forming the equator, which we can all agree that it doesn't. 
This also eliminates the Pangea concept, or rather, the Pangea evidence eliminates the rotating globe around a static axis. Pangea is presented as a very asymmetric mass concentration, while at the same time keeping the modern, quote unquote, pole axis, this alone is impossible. But then continents cannot drift over a freely spinning globe without constantly changing the rotational axis in the process, which is not observed. Non-observation of necessary consequences of a model is a deal breaker, and therefore we have identified the first major problem with a globe model. Application of theoretical concepts from the domains of geometry and kinematics to the domain of physics without regard for borders between domains. This is the discouraging result for rotation. Now what about orbit? Orbits are a theoretical construction generated in the domain of kinematics which is, as we have seen, a branch of mathematics. It is geometry in motion. Kinematics is not about massive bodies in motion. Kepler's elliptical orbits are pure kinematics. In his Mars notebook from 1602, we can witness a desperate Kepler, sensing the need for a proper approach to the concept of real masses in motion, i.e. the need for dynamics. We can sense the frustration of not having it, the frustration of realizing that you cannot think yourself to dynamics. You have to establish it as an experimental branch of physics. In one of the side notes, quote unquote, he reveals his thoughts and shows very tangibly what a violation of domains of validity looks like. The force which has some quantity for the laws of merely geometrical and consists of nodding, such as in the planets. There is no such thing as geometric force. Forces are physical. Geometry is theoretical. There is no theoretical force. So we see Kepler struggles with the transferring his kinematic concepts over to the world of real bodies, where in the end he resigns and just plays with the theory while convincing himself to be talking about reality. Newton is the one who finally felt prepared to accomplish this task, the task of making a hitherto purely theoretical concept ready to be a player in a physical world. As we have seen above, the price for switching from the theoretical domains, geometry slash kinematics, to the domains of applied physics is stop theorizing, quote unquote, and honor the answers you get. Stop imposing your ideas over a domain which isn't yours. It's nature's domain. Now, because dynamics needs masses and forces, Newton set about to define both in one fell swoop. F equals M A. The problem with this is that defining quote unquote, is something you do in theoretical domains, not something you observe in the domain of reality. So Newton didn't observe a force. He didn't observe mass. The only aspect here is the change in displacement of space per time in time, i.e. acceleration. Nobody today knows what mass is, so it is defined as mass is whatever one liter of water at four degrees Celsius is. Newton knew he needed something tangible, but force as such is not tangible. So he went with the only tangible available, the one liter of water at four degrees Celsius given the unit of one kilogram. The next step was to define the only intrinsic property of this liter of water, the only property of one kilogram of mass as its resistance to being set in motion or a change in its state of motion. The concept of resistance has the concept of force baked into its opposite. A force is what overcomes resistance. Now everything is in place. One N is defined as the force which overcomes the resistance of one kilogram of mass to be accelerated to a velocity of one meter a second over the time of one second i.e. 1n equals 
1 kgm over s squared. Now it seems we are ready for dynamics considerations, where we add the concept of force and mass to kinematic concepts of motion. And this brings us to the next scientific problem with a globe Earth, its orbit around the sun, and with it all gravitational orbits. Again, we have to stop theorizing and listen to what nature tells us because it is her domain, not ours. Orbits to the very day are based on Newton's cannonball analogy. So we have to go and ask nature what she thinks about this idea. As we went and asked nature what she thought about really rotating masses, it's hers to decide, not ours. The first answer we get in this context is the non-negotiable independence of transitional motion and freefall. This seemingly simple and straightforward answer given by Mother Nature has monumental implications. Implications Newton did not see or honor because he was a theoretician at heart after all. But this simple answer also teaches us a valuable lesson in how we should talk about reality in awareness of the three domains, geometry, kinematics, and dynamics. Let's have a look at the red dots in the above diagram. They are the positions of the horizontally moving vertical falling body over time. Now, we can all agree that the red dots connected will create the geometrical shape of a parabola. And if we watch the dots trace its path, we would see the kinematic path of a parabola evolve in time. But what answer would we get if we were to ask the body about its physical experience during the trajectory. This is the fulcrum, the crux of the matter. We would not get the answer parabola. The parabola in the domain of physical reality has disappeared, although present in geometry and kinematics. Remember that the domain of dynamics is defined by the presence and interaction of masses and forces. That is what defines this domain. If we don't honor this, we are not operating in the domain of dynamics, i.e. the domain of physical reality. So again, when asked, the body would tell us that it only experiences two rectilinear motions one uniform horizontal and one accelerated vertical, but never so much as a hint of curve. Any and every curve has a tangent, and in the domain of dynamics, every tangent on a curve has an orthogonal to it, which is called a position vector, at the end of which we find an instant center of rotation, around which the body is rotating in this specific instant. Every rotation has a force associated with it, one radial away from the instant center of rotation. Now, in the case of a cannonball, that means if the cannonball actually performed a parabola, instead of only leaving the trace of a parabola, in other words, if the parabola would be physical reality, we would need to be able to draw a tangent on any of the red dots, a position vector, and a radial force associated with rotation. Because this rotational force is not existent, as well as ruled out by the laws of freefall, a cannonball will never enter a circular path, which is the quintessential path of rotation, let alone an elliptical one, which means raising itself while in free fall. The below image shows how a violation of domains of validity ends up envisioning orbits. But Mother Nature says, no, 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 no. That's not how it works. A cannonball doesn't even know about the parabola it traces because the only motion it knows about are two rectilinear ones and rectilinear motions never produce rotational forces without which there is no orbit. So Mother Nature rules out a globe rotating the way it must. Given our pole star, she rules out orbits driven by freefall all of which already represent insurmountable problems for the globe model. But these are far from being all. Michael Brenner studied mechanical engineering and comparative linguistics at Vienna University of Technology. Even when the experts all agree, they may well be mistaken. Bertrand Russell. Science is the organized skepticism in the reliability of expert opinion. Richard Feynman. Thank you.